This is the uh, seminar, Caribbean and the Common Law. Um, it's really a follow-up of the one that we did involving Hong Kong, Australia, and New Zealand um, with our distinguished benches uh, there. And um, we've got equally distinguished benches with us this evening. Uh, and can I just briefly uh, introduce them to you? Uh, Master Janice Piera, who's the Chief Justice of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, uh, Dame Janice was the first female Chief Justice and the first person from the British Virgin Islands to become the Chief Justice in 2012. Um, we also have Master Margaret Ramsey Hale, who is currently a judge of the Grand Court in the Cayman Islands, sitting in the Distinguished Financial Services Division, former Chief Justice of the Turks and Caicos Islands and a former Chief Magistrate of the Cayman Islands. Uh, and last but not least is uh, Master, uh, Master Mitchell, Queen's Counsel, who has got considerable experience of litigation in the Caribbean. And as you can see, he is out in the Caribbean at the moment and looking suitably relaxed uh, and ready to go. Um, the format uh, for, for this evening is very simple. Um, we're going to have some short presentations, observations from our three speakers. Um, we will then go into a uh, question and answer session uh, and um, you should be able to ask your questions in the Q&A function on Zoom. So please do uh, ask your questions uh, and I'll make sure that we have enough time for that. So uh, on that basis, may I pass over to uh, Master Janice Piera to start. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Master Malik, for the opportunity, of course, to participate in this webinar this evening. Uh, and I thank you for extending the invitation to me. I, I hope to sort of briefly address everyone in relation to the Eastern Caribbean, uh, and we call it the OECS, and its relationship with the common law as well as to give a brief overview as to how our court has handled uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which started uh, early last year. And so if I may start with a sort of a short historical overview of the court, uh, the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court is a regional institution. It covers nine states and territories, six are independent states, and three are British overseas territories. It comprises, of course, two tiers, the high courts and the court of appeal. So what we have are high courts in each of the nine states, and we have uh, the court of appeal, which is basically an itinerant court, although it is not now because of COVID, um, and it covers and it would have gone uh, from island to island during the course of a year uh, hearing uh, appeal uh, cases. Now, in terms of the common law, the English common law basically has been sort of the foundation of the laws of the various OEC estates because they've all come out of a sort of a shared history uh, being former colonies of the United Kingdom. And in most of the states, you will actually find on the law books uh, an enactment which declares the application of the common law. Uh, the exception to that is St. Lucia, the state of St. Lucia, which I will come to in a bit. And in the development of the common law in the OECS, uh, no one basically, I think, really stopped to think about whether it should be applied or not applied, except in, in certain circumstances. Um, we certainly have seen uh, in our courts uh, development of the common law in some areas. For example, there has been a commercial case out of the territory of the Virgin Islands, uh, which uh, went to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, which is the final court for all of the nine states, save and accept the Commonwealth of Dominica now. And 
in that case, which was the case of Alpha Telecom and Kukurova decided by the Privy Council in 2013, uh, the Privy Council held that the court's power to grant relief from forfeiture applies to mortgages or pledges of financial instruments, and that such relief may be granted even where the collateral taker uh, exercises the power of appropriation over the collateral. Uh, in 19, 2004, there was also a bit of an extension of the common law principles in relation to negligence in a case coming out of, again, the territory of the Virgin Islands in a case called Attorney General and Hartwell. And in that case, the Privy Council determined that the police owes a duty of care to the public at large to take a reasonable care to see that officers to whom they are entrusted weapons are suitable persons, in essence, to be employed as, as police officers. Um, so that was a bit of an extension, uh, which is currently practiced in, in other states as well as the territory of the Virgin Islands. Uh, more recently, uh, the court, again, in the Virgin Islands had the case of exercising what it called the Black Swan jurisdiction coming out of the Black Swan case. And that was where the court granted standalone injunctions in aid of foreign proceedings. And that case, after 10 years, came up to the Court of Appeal, uh, which was the first occasion that it was frontally challenged before the court in terms of whether the court actually had that power. Um, the Court of Appeal held, um, yours truly included, that the power required a statutory basis uh, for its exercise. And that is now before the Privy Council. And we will soon learn what the Privy Council says about that. But uh, in any event, the Virgin Islands has now amended the Supreme Court Act to uh, ensure that the court has the power on a statutory footing uh, to grant such orders. So if I turn briefly to St. Lucia, St. Lucia has a hybrid legal system and it basically is one of the islands despite its history and its attachment to the United Kingdom, um, the history in terms of its French colonization uh, continues to feature in the life and indeed the culture and the laws of St. Lucia. Uh, the main laws is really the civil code, which is um, quite an old code. Uh, no one can find a copy of the civil code in print anymore. And when we are looking for cases to interpret certain sections of the code, we do have to turn to the old code of Quebec which has long since uh, been refined and modernized from time to time. That hasn't happened in St. Lucia. St. Lucia has its old code and what it has done, it has grafted on some common law principles on that code. For example, uh, certain provisions were changed. This was about 1956. And I gather that it's one of our earlier chief justices who was able to persuade the parliament of St. Lucia to amend the code to, to say that the laws of England for the time being in relation to torts, contracts and trusts are to be interpreted and applied in accordance with uh, the laws of England unless there is a provision in the code which expressly runs contrary to those principles. And what that has done, uh, in many cases now, we have, I think, another case going up to the Privy Council where uh, the defamation laws, for example, and when the Defamation Act came into effect in, in the UK, uh, I think in 2013 that was, uh, the point was taken that the defenses should be the statutory defenses as set out in the English Defamation Act. That caused quite a stir because the idea was 
uh, how could this be? So it called basically for an interpretation as to what exactly was imported into the code and into the laws of St. Lucia. Is it simply the English common law or is it also an importation of English statute law? And so it's quite interesting. Um, it has raised questions and debates about the sovereignty of St. Lucia and the fact that no other country should be passing laws. Um, we held that um, it's not where a country is passing laws, but it basically is an interpretation of what your law for the time being says should happen. So we will see what where that goes. But it's an interesting mix. And apart from that, of course, we do have the situation here where uh, instead of amending the civil code, what happens is that parliament, they will pass additional laws which govern certain other civil rights and obligations. And then you have the task of interpreting that in contrast with the code. So it's always interesting in St. Lucia when we sit um, to deal with cases in St. Lucia. I always say to anyone who's practicing in St. Lucia, make sure you have a copy of the civil code near to hand because you can be sure that a legal practitioner is going to refer to a provision in the civil code for its interpretation. Uh, in relation to managing the pandemic, um, before the COVID pandemic struck, of course, the region is, is very, very vulnerable to natural disasters, uh, such as hurricanes, particularly starting at this time of the year. And so the court had started uh, in 2018, basically um, coming on to an electronic platform. And when COVID struck at that time, we had about six of our nine states uh, on our electronic e-litigation portal. We have just linked another state happily. Yesterday, the state of Grenada uh, came on and we hope to, to link the two remaining states uh, before the end of July. That system allowed us to operate uh, the courts throughout the pandemic as we are doing uh, every day, uh, save and except for criminal jury trials. Uh, we have conducted all of the appeal cases uh, on Zoom platforms uh, since COVID began. And what it has also demonstrated is that perhaps we need not go anywhere for the conduct of various cases since the files can be accessed electronically and we can call in judges wherever they may be, wherever they may live amongst our nine states and territories. So even though we are separated by water, we are very much uh, integrated. And so I think that was a plus in many ways coming out of uh, the pandemic for us. Um, we have a provision in the Supreme Court Act which allowed us seamlessly to sort of incorporate our sittings wherever we may be within the jurisdiction of the nine states because it's a single jurisdiction. It runs throughout the nine uh, states and territories. And that means we could be in St. Lucia hearing a matter from St. Kitts, for example, and vice versa. Um, so that has been very, very helpful. And I think we will continue that way for some time, even perhaps when the pandemic uh, abates, I suspect that we will be doing that for quite a while. And so for us, the common law is very much a part of our systems. And it is my hope that we will continue to make strides in our development of the law, our jurisprudence in terms of the Caribbean, uh, having regard to our background or cultures or social realities, and that we remain resilient in the face of, of all the various challenges uh, that we face. That's what I wish to say. Thank you for now. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, can I now turn to Master Margaret Ramsey Hale? Might I just thank you, Master Malik and Grayson, for the invitation. It is not mine. 
I will declare immediately that the invitation was issued to my Chief Justice to address this webinar, Master Smelly in this context. Um, he has very uh, kindly attributed the contribution as being from both of us, but I'm here to declare that my contribution is solely footnoting and delivery. Um, <laughs> so, and uh, the Chief Justice in his uh, contribution has considered uh, the development of Caribbean common law arising from the need of our judges to interpret and construe Caribbean constitutions. Because our Caribbean constitutions really do lie at the center of Caribbean politics and Caribbean culture. We know we're rights, Caribbean people will tell you. Uh, in English, we know our rights. So we have developed a distinct constitutional jurisprudence, uh, which, we, which I'm going to explore briefly uh, in the contribution, let me just say, uh, from the, the Cayman Islands. The webinar is on the Caribbean and common law. And so the, the, the notion of a rela relationship between the Caribbean and the common law as distinct from the Caribbean experience of British or English jurisprudence necessarily derives from the post-colonial experience. I don't think it can be denied that there has been a successful emergence of a strong and vital Caribbean jurisprudence, having at its apogee not only the Privy Council, but the Caribbean Court of Justice as well. But this should be no surprise to anyone the law cannot stand still. It must keep pace with changes in society, and it is a task of legislatures, legislators, lawyers, and judges to ensure that the law meets the demands of society. And it is that crucial role of the judges as those charged with the responsibility for the development of the common law, this incremental conforming of the law to meet the changing values and needs of society and the interpretation of legislation in a manner that reflects current realities that uh, we hope to focus on in, in, in this contribution or indeed in this webinar. So the question we explore today is how has this process unfolded in the Commonwealth Caribbean context? And how is it likely to unfold in the future? Now, as our Chief Justice observed in a speech where he reflected on the history, meaning and importance of judicial independence from a Caribbean perspective, and I quote, the remarkable process of constitutional advancement during the period of post-colonial transitional democratization resulted in systems of government under the rule of law, which enshrined the constitution, including the Bill of Rights as the supreme law. It entrenched the doctrine of separation of powers in a manner that the Westminster Parliament even while exporting the concept to the newly independent states had not yet itself fully achieved until the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005. And so we are able to reflect upon the English speaking Caribbean constitutions as the products of their progressive generation derived from a shared political and institutional heritage with Britain. Master Smelly, as he is known to this in, continues, the constitutional laws of the English speaking Caribbean have changed only incrementally in relative terms since the wave of constitutional reform that swept into being the independence constitutions of the 1960s. The same holds true in relation to those territories such as the Cayman Islands, which have remained constitutionally and politically a part of the United Kingdom. Such a history of constitutional affairs can surely be regarded as a measure of the stability of the democracies of the Caribbean, the Commonwealth Caribbean. With the notably exceptions of Grenada in 1979, and the Turks and Caicos Islands in 2009, 
the states of the English speaking Caribbean have remained. Andrew, do you want to, to start and then. Can I pick up and. and yeah, we uh, go back. And right. help and, yeah. and go back. I, I, it, it, it was a, a real um, pleasure to, to listen to um, what's going on in the Eastern Caribbean courts, Master, because I, I um, it, it helped me uh, underscore the, the things that I would like to say. But can I begin, Master Malik, Treasurer? Thank you very much to you and to Grayson for the invitation. It, it's lovely to be remembered out here in the Turks and Caicos Islands, where I am currently uh, stationed, billeted, um, waiting to restart a very long trial that collapsed sadly with the death of the judge. And we start again next Thursday. But I think over the years of, of coming to the Caribbean and to many of its jurisdictions, one of the things that I have learned is that if you turn up from the English bar with an air, an air of superiority, you are failing to begin with. If you turn up not only with that air of um, superiority, but that air of uh, I'm from England and I know best, and I'm going back well over 20 years thinking about those experiences that I had with lawyers that did that, um, you, you simply will not have the judge's ear to begin with. Knowing the, the little practices, the nuances of, of different jurisdictions, for instance, in Trinidad, where it's the junior's pleasure to introduce um, his legal team, instructing attorney and his leader, um, which is something that, that unless you learn the nuances of your jurisdiction, you won't pick up. But, but perhaps more importantly, um, and this is a, a one-man campaign, I think, that I've been carrying out for the last two decades, um, when you're doing a skeleton argument, referring to the Court of Appeal, when in fact you're referring to a case from the English and Welsh Court of Appeal, again, doesn't go down well if you're appearing in the Court of Appeal in Trinidad or in the Court of Appeal in the Turks and Caicos Islands or in the Eastern Caribbean. That is their Court of Appeal. And they are entitled to be referred to as the Court of Appeal. Um, and the English and Welsh Court of Appeal authority upon which you rely is simply that, an English and Welsh Court of Appeal authority. Uh, and it's also very important that when you find authority from England and Wales that you think you want to rely on, look locally, shop locally, and see whether you can find cases with the same principles that have been developed out of the country or the region um, in relation to that particular common law point. And you will be much better placed before the court in which you appear. Uh, the Supreme Court, of course, is um, not the Supreme Court in the Caribbean. It is the United Kingdom Supreme Court. And again, when, when I see skeleton arguments from English counsel, even leading counsel, that refers to the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeal, I, I am on, I'm afraid, the, the back foot when I look at what they're saying and, and, and immediately wondering whether they've really done their homework. And I have found that the, the right way is to look local, um, look there to see what the principles are, ask around, speak to colleagues. And of course, these days, most of the um, jurisdictions have their authorities online. Even now, Little Turks and Caicos Islands in the last few months has got its own Turks and Caicos um, legal um, information website where you can find judgments going all the way back. So shop local, look local, because that's where the common law is being um, developed. And, and indeed, Dame Janice was right about these the, the cultural nuances that will affect the way the common law develops. And therefore, because it's been decided that way in England, it doesn't mean necessarily to say it will be decided that way elsewhere, or that there isn't another authority with a nuance that would um, help you develop your argument. I, I, indeed, in um, <clears throat> recent weeks, following the, the death of the judge and the arguments about A and whether or not there should be a retrial, it was a case from Anguilla decided at first instance, which was really helpful, which brought together all the principles about um, 
staying a, a criminal case f following a, a lengthy period. Uh, and one of the interesting things that we all forget in England, although we've had the Human Rights Act now for many, many years, is constitutions do make a difference. And just because something sounds good under the common law, it doesn't necessarily mean it survives a test under the constitution, uh, which leads me, I, I, I think, happily to talk about a little bit of COVID and the development of the common law here, because um, when COVID started, the late judge went back to his home jurisdiction, which was Jamaica. And um, we tried to encourage him, the Crown tried to encourage him to carry on the trial from Jamaica. And the constitutional challenge was taken that he wasn't here, he was there, and therefore he wasn't in the Turks and Caicos Islands and shouldn't, be, shouldn't continue the trial. And the judge who heard the constitutional motion decided that in that of the seven heads of argument taken by the um, applicants who were the defendants in the criminal trial, one of them stood the test and she struck um, the decision of the, um, the regulatory decision to allow cases to be tried from overseas down. And of course, off we went to the Court of Appeal who were sitting in the Bahamas and in Barbados and in Trinidad. So there was a certain irony in that, as you can imagine. Um, and they unanimously, in three judgments, which are well worth reading, came to the conclusion there was absolutely nothing wrong with the judge continuing to try the matter from uh, Jamaica. It was no challenge to Jamaica's sovereignty, and it certainly didn't matter so far as um, Turks and Caicos were concerned. And off we went to the Privy Council. And that was a bleary-eyed half past five in the morning start from here in Turks and Caicos Islands as we had our day in the Privy Council before five judges who were each in their um, homes, each sitting in their studies or sitting rooms um, at, at the time high, it, the, the um, pandemic was, was quite bad in England. And what conclusion did they reach? the conclusion reached plainly, and you can see the way the world is moving, that it was absolutely fine for the judge to sit in Jamaica because his jurisdiction was being exercised in the Turks and Caicos Islands. He was, uh, as we remarked, he was plain Paul Harrison, because he retired as a judge, plain Mr. Paul Harrison in Jamaica. And the only time he became Mr. Justice Paul Harrison was when that screen went on and he appeared in the courtroom or in the court or on screen um, from Jamaica, but in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Uh, and to show how the common law moves, because following that decision, uh, and I think quite bravely, though um, hearing Dame Janice, um, perhaps not as, as brave as I think, um, they passed legislation here in Turks and Caicos Islands that permanently now enshrines in the law the right of the judge to sit anywhere. Uh, and Jane Janice, you'll be interested to know that at the moment, um, Shiraz Aziz is sitting in London trying a criminal case with a jury in the Turks and Caicos Islands. It's wrong, and I, I understand from those that have either watched on Facebook or have um, been part of the process that it's worked extremely well. Very, very interesting. And so we have much to learn from uh, the Caribbean and the development of the Caribbean common law and indeed the development of each individual island's common law that all of course look to a um, Privy Council bar uh, one nation that look to a Privy Council for ultimate guidance. But that guidance that you get from the Privy Council is always going to be reflective or as best it can be of the cultural, recognizing the, the cultural differences and nuances of each of the jurisdictions uh, in respect of the material that comes before it. So my message is that so far as the Caribbean and the common law is concerned is that it's robust, it's maturing, it is um, capable of developing quickly, look at the reaction um, to COVID and online hearings, and the future is bright. But if you want to come to the Caribbean and practice, remember 
you're not carrying that superiority of the English bar, which some of us have. Um, you're coming here um, to roll your sleeves up, understand the local law uh, and contribute with the knowledge and expertise that you bring uh, to the development of the common law in the Caribbean. Thank you, very, thank, you, thank, thank you very much, Andrew. Well, we, we're still out of contact, unfortunately, with um, Master uh, Margaret uh, Ramsey Hell, and it's possible that, that there's been an outage or some kind in Cayman, which makes it difficult. So we we'll just continue, if we may, um, with our two speakers. Um, the question I've got um, for Dame Janice is really trying to look look ahead in terms of how proceedings are likely to change as a result of our experience in with COVID. I mean, one of this example is the way that I think we've all got used to using electronic files and PDFs, hearing bundles. They're, they're almost becoming a thing of the past. Um, there's also this ability to get together wherever we are. But 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 it, are you missing anything in terms of not having counsel physically in in front of you? Are you missing not sitting with other judges where you can chat outside over coffee? Is that something that you're missing that you will try to get back, or or do you think we will become remote courts um, into the future, where we where, where as you say we'll be sitting all over the world and just beaming up and really the, 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 the jurisdiction is just, you know, obviously relevant for the, the law, but uh, we're all over the place. So where do you, where do you think we're going to end up, Dame Janice? Yes. Uh, well, I, I really do hope that we can get back at some point to being able to assemble. We all enjoyed, um, particularly the Court of Appeal when we traveled uh, amongst the states, and we would perhaps be in the, sa the same hotel, we would have lunch together, we would be able to have breakfast together. We miss those, those, those opportunities uh, to have that kind of interaction and so on. So I'm hoping that at some point we will be able to get back uh, to traveling. We had um, what I thought was a sort of a, a great smile uh, two weeks ago, we were sitting uh, for the Court of Appeal for St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And it was more or less a sort of a blended approach where persons were at the court in St. Vincent, but members of the panel, we, I was in St. Lucia, another member was in the, the Virgin Islands and another um, in St. Vincent. And the bailiff came on from St. Vincent and he has a very, you know, a great booming voice to announce the opening of court. And it just boomed over everyone else. And then we all thought, don't we miss that <laughs> with, <laughs> with the bailiff? Because that's what he would do uh, whenever we travel there and just, um, you know, him sort of taking care of us and, and knowing us so well. So I, I'm really hoping that we will get back to being able to sit. But I, I think what is going to continue will be the flexibility with which we can uh, sometimes hear more cases uh, because it is so easy to have access now to all the materials and documents that we need. So uh, judges, I think, have become more comfortable with PDF documents. We still print uh, a few, but if you ever have the experience of our court in traveling on the plane with sometimes about 40 bankers boxes of material. We, we really don't miss that. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. Um, Andrew, have you got any views in terms of where you see the future? I mean, because I, I, I can see there might be an issue where um, if, if, if the London bar is basically allowed to come in and all over the place, does that give us an unfair advantage? I mean, is there going to be certain well, types of cases, for example, with oral witnesses where we will be expected to come? Have you got a feel for what's that's like quite, that, that's quite That's a very interesting question. But, but, uh, and can I just pick up something um, from what Master Pereira said? Because I'm, I'm wondering whether the, the, the conviviality of the court sitting together is one thing, 
um, but the court having to go and travel to different jurisdictions, maybe another. In other words, could the court sit in a jurisdiction and hear appeals from um, other countries? Uh, and, th and that may, may um, bridge both issues. It allows for more litigation from different, from different jurisdictions, but also allows the Court of Appeal to be together. But that is, as, as to your point, um, obviously there are a lot, a lot of witnesses um, giving evidence uh, by video link. And there are, there are um, strong views both ways about the effectiveness of the attorneys appearing in the courtroom facing the witness or dealing with it online. Uh, witnesses have been giving evidence online and will continue to give evidence online. And that was before the pandemic. It's obviously increased during the pandemic um, and will continue hereafter because it's much more convenient for the witnesses. But the ability of the bar to appear from England um, in other jurisdictions is, is something which I imagine those jurisdictions are going to um, continue to jealously, rightly, um, guard against uh, and and for the English bar to appear um, pro hack vice in cases where their expertise is proven to be justified and that becomes um, important but then similarly and you mentioned this the other day when we were having our um, pre um, get together um, why shouldn't a now maturing Caribbean bar be given access to the English courts Oh, I can see that Margaret Ramsey Hill is back. Welcome back to her. But but I do pose that question, one I think you want to pick up on in, in any event. And that is why why shouldn't the um, Bar Council look at and consider uh, allowing those who are established in their home jurisdictions but are common law jurisdictions where the English Bar have the right to practice on a reciprocal arrangement to come and practice in this post-Brexit world in England? Well, if, if we perhaps can just follow up um, a couple of the questions, perhaps related to that. Um, two questions which are directed to you, Andrew. Um, first question from Kylie Stubbs is, is what, if one was interested in practicing in the Caribbean, how would you recommend obtaining sufficient experience to develop a practice? What are the tips? But you're mute. Forgive me, I'm, all, I'm always at least once make that mistake. Um, the, the, the tip is to identify the jurisdiction because it isn't going to be many of them. You may move from one to the other as you um, develop, but that is a life-changing decision to come and move to the Caribbean, to live here with a view to developing practices in more than one jurisdiction. Um, but, it, but it is a question of making a lifestyle change if it is to develop a practice in the Caribbean as opposed to coming out from time to time to do cases. And, and therefore it is a question of finding the right place that you want to go to. Um, finding the right attorney or firm of attorneys that you'd like to work with that may want to have um, you with them. The dog is about to, no, the dog was about to bark. I thought somebody walked past my study. Um, and, then, uh, 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 and then making the decision to go and stay for sufficient period to do your pupillage or training uh, and, and during that time, learning whether or not it is the right thing for you. There are differences, there are nuances in each of the jurisdictions and the way that um, people um, practice uh, and present um, material. And so therefore you're gonna have to choose one, um, go and learn the trade there. You'll have a great start having been at the bar in England uh, and see if it's the, the right place for you. I, I mean, I commend it. I, I absolutely love working. A question for uh, Dame Janice um, about, on average, how many cases are heard in the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court? Is regulatory law an area of law in demand in the Caribbean? Does one need to be naturalized in a particular Caribbean country in order to practice in the Caribbean? Uh, are you happy dealing with those questions?
You're on mute. All right, here I am. Um, in relation to practice uh, in the, and I, I will speak for the OECS because uh, I am familiar, of course, with the laws, but in each of those states, of course, notwithstanding the fact that the court has a single jurisdiction, uh, each state has its domestic laws to which you, you would have to comply. For example, uh, being admitted, getting any uh, necessary sort of regulatory permits uh, as the case may be. You do not have to be naturalized. Um, you, you can be resident and working. Um, and once you have the qualifications, which are either qualifications uh, through the University of the West Indies and the Council of Legal Education uh, in the Caribbean, or uh, you have your qualifications, which are your English qualifications, then that normally would entitle you to be admitted uh, to practice uh, in any one of the states. Um, the laws, they basically sort of run along similar lines because the Supreme Court Act, which is basically the Companion Act, is an act which is enacted in all of the nine states and territories for the operation of the court. Um, they now have, uh, I think, amounts of at least seven uh, additionally legal profession acts um, which govern the profession uh, as well. Okay. The um, there's another que there's, there's a quite a specific question for for you, uh, Dame Janice. Again, at the top there from Jonathan Reynolds about specific cases where the St. Lucia Co Code and the English and Welsh Welsh common law have come into conflict. Um, is that is that? Can you think of anything at the moment on that? Um, I there are a number of cases, um, but not necessarily that they're in conflict. I think the arguments would normally be uh, whether or not uh, there is a codal provision which applies uh, as distinct from a, a provision of the common law. As I said, it is not all of the common law in St. Lucia. It's very specific to the importation in relation to torts, contracts, quasi-contracts, and the law of trusts. Everything else um, comes under one code, whether it's the, the civil code, simpliciter, or the criminal code, or the commercial code, as the case may be. So those are the areas, the, the three main areas that are impacted by the common law expressly um, because there was an amendment provision to the code which incorporated uh, English law into those particular areas of law. Thank you. Um, another question um, for uh, Dame Janice, which I think was well, slightly related. I don't know whether you can see it on screen, but it's basically a, an, an argument. It's, it's a question that, that makes the point that a law reflects the culture of its people. Is it true for the Eastern Caribbean? If so, has it ever been a challenge to merge English interpretation and culture? If there has been, how did you navigate through the challenge? Yes, uh, there are cases where um, you may have to consider the background. And of course, as I think as uh, Master Ramsey was explaining, Ramsey Hale, all of these islands uh, are governed by the constitutions. In the independent states, uh, it is expressed that their constitutions are the supreme law. And so all laws, provisions are basically judged against the provisions of the constitution. And you will find, I think as Master Mitchell said, nuances in terms of how a particular law or particular principle may be interpreted uh, in accordance with how that, that person's rights under the constitution. For example, he mentioned, you know, stay of proceedings um, in, in criminal cases. That will draw quite a bit on what is really the, the socioeconomic landscape or framework within a particular 
uh, Caribbean context to determine whether or not it would be fair and just uh, to grant a stay or not. Okay. Um, a question about the, the relationship of the Inn and the Caribbean. I mean, if, if we go back many years, I suspect it would be the case that a, a lot of the lawyers who ended up in the Caribbean would have qualified in London and done their pupillage here and then gone back. Um, that's clearly not happening now. Um, I mean, we're obviously very keen to uh, build up ties with the, uh, the, the Caribbean. And you saw the, the lecture I gave on the city of the law about the international reach of Gray's Inn um, and, and promoting the rule of law. Uh, have, have you got any thoughts as to what the Inn should be doing to improve its relationship with, with its friends in the Caribbean? Yes. Um, for example, there is, I think, for the University of the West Indies, uh, also um, the various, uh, there's the OECS, which is basically a bar association, uh, which comprise all of the constituent bars associations of the Eastern Caribbean. And what they do, it would be useful, I think, if one were to reach out. Um, and they have various events where, um, you know, persons can participate and basically develop a partnership, I think. I, I, may, may I come in there, um, yes. Ali? I, I think that there is a, a, a crying need. Um, and as um, COVID lifts, it, it, it can become practical of, of offering um, some sort of scholarship arrangement for um, young lawyers to, out, who are fresh out of the university to come and do mini or a little longer than a mini pupillage in London. I think one of the things um, that, that is missing going straight from university in the West Indies into practice is that short opportunity to see how the bar operates in London and I think, or in England, I think it does make a difference. I, I can tell those who have been to England and obviously here in Turks and Caicos, most, well, in fact, all the lawyers, I think even if they've been to University of West Indies, go um, to England to qualify and then come back um, here to practice. And I, I think there's a lot to be said for having some sort of um, scholarship arrangement which gets some of the young lawyers an opportunity to, to come to England. I mean, we, before I, I came here, but going back many years, um, we used to take a young prosecutor from the DPP's office in Jamaica for six months um, in London. And it worked really, really well. They learned a lot about prosecuting. They were taken into the CPS. They, they were taken into the SFO and obviously spent time um, on the coal face with prosecutors in chambers. I think, I think there's a lot to be said for, for that. Uh, and I, I, I hope um, that that's something that if we could find the funding, we would, we would think about trying to facilitate. And of course that then develops links and relationships. Just, just a question for you in terms of um, the diversity issues that are affecting us. We've, we've had lots of discussions in the year about diversity in the context of the, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, other equality issues as well, gender, LGBTQ. Uh, and what's, what, what, are, what are you chatting about in, in the Caribbean? Do you, what are the issues on, on those matters that affect you? Well, the, when we speak of gender, we know we don't share your concern. Uh, we don't have issues of women not rising in the ranks to become silks or rising in the ranks to take their place on the bench. Uh, Dame Pereira, Master Pereira, as you've heard, was the, I think she was the first female Chief Justice of the OECS. I was the first female Chief Justice of the Turks and Caicos Islands, but neither of us will be the last as the number of graduates from the Norman Manley Law School and the Eugene de Preach Law School and the Law School in Trinidad, Hugh Wooding, as a number of law graduates uh, comprise more and more women going forward. 
It's merely a, a process of attrition. We will soon be in all positions which are legal. Uh, already the conversation has started. In fact, it started 20 years ago. Uh, the question was being asked, uh, how do we deal with the marginalization of the West Indian male? I think our female view is that the West Indian male is not being marginalized. But what I can say is this, that in the ordinary fields of endeavor where men used to dominate, like law, the numbers graduating from the respective law schools are uh, the majority female. And so in our future, in as little as 10 years, I think looks very bright. Janice, do you want to say anything on that issue? Well, I, I agree with, with Master Ramsey Hale on that, but I would add that what I would like to see in the Caribbean more uh, is where uh, women uh, become uh, prime ministers, small female prime ministers across the region. Um, I, I would like to see more women basically in the lawmaking uh, branch of the government in terms of the, the kinds of provisions in relation to, to various laws. Uh, um, I remember one time I was trying to uh, inquire as to how to really push certain family uh, issues. And um, a, a senator who I think was in the, in the Senate of Trinidad and Tobago, she says, what you need Chief Justice is to really get a champion in <laughs> the Houses of Parliament. To, to really push legislation in terms of ensuring equality and fairness as it relates to, to gender issues. And so while it is not in terms of the legal profession, I think by sheer uh, education, still, I think it, it is real that we do have some issues where one wants to see a greater gender equity, not necessarily in relation to just the legal profession, but just broadly across other areas of society. I would just wonder if I may, Master Malik, ask mm -hmm. this question, is the absence of women uh, from these areas of endeavor uh, an indication of some cultural or societal barrier? And I would say no. Uh, Jamaica has its female law officer. It has had its female prime minister. Uh, Turks and Caicos has had its female uh, premier. The current uh, law, law officer in Turks is also female. So I, 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 don't, I don't think it's a structural barrier. I think if it, if it is anything, it may be that women mm. have no appetite for the political arena. Uh, and I agree with you, if they do not, then they should be encouraged to engage in, in, in that space. But in terms of barriers, uh, like the systemic and structural barriers that exist, say in England, to women achieving success across the board, but particularly in law, this, the, the, the way they fall off before they become silks. The very poor uptake of women on the bench in, 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 in uh, the UK. I think, I think we can certainly in the Caribbean be proud of what we have achieved. Well, look, uh, we're, we've, we've, we've almost come to the end. I don't know whether, Sam, you can get uh, Sir Marston Gibson on the screen because I wanted to say hello to him. Uh, he's got a question. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Sir Marston is recently uh, retired as the Chief Justice uh, of Barbados, and we were at college together, so it would be very good to see him after very many years, if it's possible. Welcome. What's your question? Um, actually, my question was, was answered, and, and Ali, it's, it's, good, it's good to see you. Very, very good. The last time we saw each other... Uh, that I can remember was in 2003, I had come up um, for a Gordy at Keeble College. And I came down to, to, to your chambers and saw you and, and Hodge and had, had lunch with Hodge. Hodge is, is Ali's brother who was a year behind us uh, in Keeble College. Um, my, my question was actually partially answered by, um, by, by Master Mitchell. 
and it was this is we tend because of the col colonial experience we've often utilized English decisions and you know the House of Lords and uh, decisions of the Privy Council which, which um, and I will get to that in a second but which which ultimately became part of our law and I'd ask the question whether or not it is likely that um, our cases, meaning the cases from say the Caribbean Court of Justice or even our courts of appeal would be cited in English in English cases. And Master Mitchell had assured me that they are, in some cases they have been. Uh, the reason, the, part of the reason why I asked that, case, that question was because a few years ago, and um, Master Mitchell, uh, uh, I think it's, your area is in, in criminal law, so I'm, and the question, I'm, the, the comment I'm going to make is has to relate, relation to criminal law. But you'll, you'll recall that a few years ago, the, Privy, the Supreme Court of the UK and the Privy Council had two cases, one on appeal from, I think it was uh, Bermuda, uh, and, an, and an English case, the English case, the name I forget now, but the the case on a, that came from Bermuda, I think, was Jolie, and the issue was uh, one of participation in 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 crime. Um, and it was the question was whether or not we were going to continue to follow the Privy Council decision of I think it was Chang Wei Kyung, the, the that 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 decision of it said that as long as a reasonable man would have would have felt that you were aware of what was going to happen, then you you are guilty as a principal, and uh, the, both the Privy Council and the and the Supreme Court on the same day, <laughs> on the same day, just switching hats, um, said, uh, "No, we are get, getting rid of Chang Wei, and we are going to we are going to um, utilize the, the 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 idea um, that you have to prove each person's participation and prove." His individual mens rea, and you can't use the idea of a reasonable man. And I thought that that was one of those situations where it was ripe for cross fertilization, where English law was going to adopt, um, going to adopt Caribbean principles. But of course, uh, the fact of the matter is that it was it was the same set of judges, English judges, who were making, who were making the decision. Uh, you know, so um, uh, it was not a situation where we had, for example. Uh, decisions in which in which the 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 court was going to be utilizing say Australian authority, you know. Uh, but but you'd answer the question because I, I, uh, from from what you said, Mars Master Mitchell, it appears that the CCJ decisions are being utilized, and that is that that is a very welcome development because because we we have a lot of discussions in the CCJ about whether we should continue, and with and if I may make one last comment. When, when I sat as president of the Court of Appeal of Barbados, my colleagues and I would insist, we would not, we would not permit, we would insist that your first cases that you should cite to us are either CCJ decisions, decisions of the Barbados Court of Appeal, decisions of the Barbados High Court, or Caribbean decisions before you go to England. So don't run to Cheshire and Fife at all. Or to or run to 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 uh, Sir Rupert Cross on evidence uh, to tell us what happened what happened in Subramaniam and against the King Emperor. We don't want to know. We want to know what what the local hearsay decisions in, uh, in in the Caribbean, you know. And so so, but I I I thank you very much for for, for allowing me to participate and uh, and uh, allowing me to see my 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 old my old colleague. Uh, Ali, Ali Malik again. We, we we had many a good time in Oxford. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, I think you need to stop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think that's probably where you stop on that basis. But uh, thank you very much, Marston. It's 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 very good to see you. Um, I mean, I don't know whether any any whether Margaret Master Margaret Ramsey Hale or uh, Master Janice Pira wanted to, to comment on that. I mean, it seems to me what was being said makes a lot of sense, but I mean, speaking for myself, you know, I, I frequently look at the website of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. There's very interesting decisions there. 
And if the opportunity arose, uh, I, I'm certain that I would cite uh, in, uh, an authority in London, um, and, I, and I'm sure that the case would be would be looked at and heard. Um, I would just this master Malik, since you invited me to comment, which is I did a case a uh, judicial review a couple months ago, where Crown Council, who is from England, told me that Parliament was sovereign. Right. Okay. Right. Well, <laughs> that's, that, that's a concept which we just don't have in, in the Caribbean. The Constitution, it's like, I couldn't believe when he said it. I don't know, I forget the exact context, but I remember he kept repeating it too. And I thought, no. To okay. Marston. Yeah. Good. Well, look, on that basis, can I, can I wrap up then by, on behalf of everybody listening to this, to, to thank um, our speakers, um, um, very interesting, important subjects, uh, and, and it goes without saying that we very much look forward to seeing you in London, your home in Grey's Inn. Um, we're about to get back, we think, and uh, hopefully we'll start to travel, but um, you're, you're all very welcome. Uh, and also a thank you to, to my old friend and colleagues, Sir Marston Gibson, for, for crashing at the very end, uh, my invitation. Um, um, but thank you all very much, and um, and I thank everybody who uh, who listened in and asked questions. Thank you.